today we are here to attend the, the talk by Pietro Ferreira from Université Paris Saclay, France. So Pietro Ferreira received the Bachelor of Engineering uh, in Electronics and Computer Engineering in 2026 and the Master in Microelectronics in 2028 from the Federal University of Rio de Janeiro, Brazil, and the PhD degree in Communications and Electronics from the Telecom Paris, uh, France, researching a high performance, high reliability circuits and system. He joined IM2NP lab for one year and IEMN lab for two years during the tenure track. Since 2014, he has been associate professor at Université Paris Saclay, Central Superlec, uh, GPS, France. In 2019, he defended his research direction project, HDR, in physics from the University Université Paris Saclay. His research interest in is design methodologies for harsh environments, microwave and ultra low power integrated circuits. Recent projects aims the Internet of Things uh, industry considering AI edge and reliability. So thank you very much, Pietro, again, for accepting to give this first uh, cast talk 2024. And the floor is with you to start your uh, presentation. Thank you very much, Professor Hay. It's a pleasure to be here. And uh, here we are be talking about results from many students and people that I work with in my uh, team. And uh, we have been interested on energy efficiency and uh, edge AI on IoT. Uh, both of them, they will go together. And I will try to pass from this presentation from challenges and uh, context, from challenges and context to also later describe how we can design these neuromorphic chips and uh, to do so i will go back to go forward and uh try to teach you in very simple words the fundamentals of neuromorphic circuits and uh to end this presentation this talk we will talk about physical implementations and illustrations about neuromorphic circuits and systems so let's start and uh, before talking about artificial intelligence one of the things that we have to think is about natural intelligence. And natural intelligence means brains, biological solution of uh, neural networks. And this is actually based on cells on the cortex and is made by ion conductions. There are potassium and sodium ions that go into or out of the living cells. And this will generate a differential of potential and spikes on the membrane of our brain cells. And this spike generation and propagations is what makes us make uh, computing calculation and also to have memory. Both are together in the same spot, in the same uh, cell. However, when we talk about in artificial intelligence, we most see uh, software solutions. And what we, when we talk about software solutions, we can see this classic input layer, output layer, and many middle hidden layers where neurons are connected using a specific, what we call synaptic weight. And each neuron has many inputs and many outputs. We sum these inputs, and then we pass some kind of a nonlinear uh, function that will generate what we call the neural network. And this is actually what we can see for artificial intelligence. Uh, most of these solutions are binary based and they are constrained to von Neumann computer. <clears throat> when we uh, look for this kind of an artificial intelligence and intelligence in general, inside of a computer, inside of uh, electronics, <clears throat> the first word that comes in our mind is actually cloud computing. And when we check the literature, what we see is uh, many achievements on cloud computing, considering deep neural networks, high and complex capabilities to do calculations. Uh, we have uh, seen also many easy tools to use to design and uh, to draw neural networks. And uh, maybe in your school and in your university, like ours, uh, we have some studies and uh, lab courses that uh, students in bachelors they are able to draw, to design their own neural network and to have their software-based cloud computing. The perspectives on research in this field is novel architectures, novel 
properties of neural networks, hyperparameters, how these uh, models will be more deeper, bigger, complex, and address even more uh, the capabilities of the human brain. However, when we think about neuromorphic sequence, we will see in the literature the main achievements of AI Edge. And when we talk about AI Edge, is having artificial intelligence in hardware, hardware-based artificial intelligence. And it's close as possible of the sensor to make a smart sensing. And this sensing, this smart neuromorphic circuits, they are real-time circuits. However, most of the achievements are digital-based in this AI edge, and they are made by circuit and memory separated. The perspectives on uh, neuromorphic circuits are more on uh, reducing of the silicon surface, because by reducing silicon surface, we reduce the cost of the circuit. Reducing power, because we need to address problems like IoT battery less or battery power circuit, and where power is limited. And if we combine these two together, what we can also talk about and see perspectives is are in energy efficiencies. Is how we use the energy and how better we can use this energy to address this problem. When we use artificial intelligence, we also are interested about the environment. And nowadays, my students and maybe you who are watching this stream now uh, are looking to uh, solutions that address the problems of the society, how we better use the energy, how we got, get green. And when we think about soft-based cloud computing, I have here three examples with some numbers. They are not so green. If we check some AI data center, and this is a classic data center from GAFA uh, industry, uh, the cloud AI uh, is about of 2.5 million servers, and it's consuming, according to uh, Wikipedia, 15.5 uh, terawatts per terawatts hour in 2020 during the COVID crisis. If we move forward to the project called DeepMind, who is using GPUs to play Go. Go is a simple game, uh, uh, Asian Chinese game at Go. Uh, it has a structure of a deep neural network working with more than 2,000 GPUs, and the power required to play Go is about 200 kilowatts. And uh, recently, we have uh, seen this uh, need of autonomous car, and everyone would like to drive a car that you don't need to drive, you just enjoy the trip. And to have an autonomous car, uh, according to this research report that I cited here on the bottom of the page, uh, we can see uh, being used a specific integration integrated circuits using convolution neural networks, and they have about 64 CNNs. Uh, what they have presented is uh, they need 30 kilowatts hour to run 100 miles. So if we turn things in some specific uh, and uh, numbers that are achievable, 100 miles or in kilometers is 250 kilometers in, in average. Uh, 30, kilometer, 30 kilowatt hours is actually the same energy required to run these miles. So you need like a, a one energy source to battery the wheels, the motor of the car, and another one to, to battery the convolution neural networks able to autonomous drive the car for you. So you need actually two uh, motors to drive this car, which is not feasible and not green at all. So the research challenge are to propose a low power edge AI solution in IoT, uh, we'll be looking in our team uh, how the base at spike in neural networks. Uh, another thing that is important to, to drive in this challenge is pass from human to IoT cognition. Uh, most of the research in the literature, they are looking for human cognition, which means vision, hearing, uh, tactile. But IoT doesn't see or hear. It communicates with electromagnetic field, temperature gradient. It can sense pressure, acceleration. And we have overpass from human cognition to IoT cognition. The third research challenge in this field is a press from analog to digital converter to have more uh, information to digital converter and uh, get out of this idea of uh, data conversion to more information conversion. This has actually helped us the fourth challenge which is minimize communication data to AI cloud. Actually, uh, we uh, consume power 
on uh, conversion of data, instrumentation, but also on communication of data. So at the end of the day, big data means big power consumption. And we have to result, reduce the big data on the information uh, conver conversion, but also when we communicate this data to the cloud. And this is our demand challenge. So let's try to see how we can design this neuromorphic circuits and go directly off what the literature has presenting. <clears throat> First of all, we are based on this hierarchical design flow of uh, scientific methodology in electronics research. Uh, if you are doing research on electronics right now, uh, you know that, that we have like system level on the top and this is more mathematical thinking. And in SNN, in, uh, in a neural network point of view, we will be talking about deep neural networks, convolutional neural networks, feed forwards, or spike in neural networks. And this is the mathematical architecture point of view. When you go on the bottom and we check the physical level, we will see this processes level. And if we read the literature, what we can find in them is they are mostly aiming 65 nanometers or 28 nanometers, which means advanced technology nodes. And the reason is we need the transition frequency greater than a few hundred gigahertz, a ratio between E on and E off of 10 powers eight to reduce the leakage and also reduce the power consumption. And the third challenge is uh, to take care of uh, the silicon surface. So to give you a number, uh, we need that one cent of fire uh, consumes less area than one micro per 55 nanometers for example. This is our, the main uh, topics. And in electronics, what we work in is in between these two. We work in circuit level by proposing new models for neurons, synapses, spike counters that will produce and generate and uh, calculate spikes and circuits. And in transitional level, we have models, models for specific kinds of neurons and synapses that will be used to build the neural network that we are talking about. So let's straight drive to the literature of uh, electronic neurons and how we can design. I have checked this review here on the top. And what we can see is uh, two driven. Uh, one is the complexity of the models. Another one is the biological inspiration of the models. And I have cited four of them. The first one is Maculop uh, neuron. This one is very common on digital and software based implementations. I will not talk about that uh, for obvious reasons of this topic. Uh, the second one is leak, integrate, and fire. This one is very simple to explain. It's a, a very first order differential equation. Uh, you can write a MATLAB if you want. And it's actually a charge and a discharge of a capacitor. So by simple equations and by a simple circuit, anyone could draw a circuit that works like this but this is less biomimetic than the counterparts. The third one is uh, proposed by Izikevich, uh, researched on biology in mathematic field, and can it be implemented in analog or digital circuits? It's more biomimetic, which is good. It has a simple mathematical model that you can put on MATLAB on coding. And uh, the problem or the drawback of this model is it has a discontinuous model and a jumping method in the model that is hard to be implemented in low power design, in low power hardware. The latest one is uh, the so-called Morris Lecker. There is another equivalent also called Hodding Huxley. They're in the names of the researchers on this field. And it's actually nowadays uh, analog only implementation. It's very biomimetic. It's very bio inspired, inspired by the measurements of the neurons. And uh, it's very complex if you want to type your mathematical model and code it on MATLAB. However, the same equations that you use for the biological model are similar equations that you have in transistors when you operate them in low power. So it's actually low power implementation enabled. And the question that we can ask at this point is, which one is the best? And this is actually an open question on research. If we try to go deep in details, the first one, the leak integrated fire neuron, is actually a very simple topology, and it uh, has a two inverter, the inverter number one and the inverter number two. And you have a feedback loop by the transistor number three. And what is happening is the current IX charge the capacitor CF, and the transistor three discharge this capacitor considering the value of the potential of the membrane and the output threshold. 
And this threshold can be controlled by the, the two inverters in the chain. Don't forget the leaky capacitance, the leak parasit device, they have to be considered because this is where it comes from, the leaky current that integrates. Uh, it is very small leakage. It, it's a very a variant with a small leakage and it's a very good implementation. And it, there is also a lower dynamic range comparing with the counterparts. But the model is quite simple. And here we can see some uh, measurement results from uh, this publication here uh, on, on top top. Uh, if you are interested in more details and how to use this uh, model. The second model that I present in my talk is the Morris Lacquer E-Neuro. Once again, we see this transistor level implementation, which is actually transistor inverter number one, inverter number two. And you have some kind of time constants that you can control both of them. One transistor, the P-type, charges the sodium, models the movement of the sodium ions into the membrane and the N type discharges the membrane and models the movement of the, so the potassium ions going out of the membrane. This topology, topology could also be simplified by it by reducing the biomimetism behind of this. Uh, one of the interesting uh, strategies that have been presented in the state of the art is they have found a reducing area and power consumption. And the strategy to reduce area and power consumption are two. First, we can increase the F spike. And second, we can change the node and move to a smaller node. For example, we know that it does even better in 28 nanometers, according to this publication here. Now we have talked about neurons. Let's talk about what connect neurons, which means the synapses. When we see the electronic synapses in the literature, you have two main options, main resistors and not main resistors. What are main resistors? Main resistors actually is a passive device that correlates electromagnetic flux with electric charge. And actually it has a high stasis curve movement that moves from one relationship between voltage and current to a second one relationship that you see first one here in this graph in blue and the second one in purple and this changing is controlled by the memory inside of the past information that passed by the main resistor which is quite good low power passive perfect however this solution is not cmos enabled technology which means that it's still here today in economy at high costs of production and mostly on research on scientific domain. So you cannot go to one website that you usually buy resistors and now ask to buy main resistors, not today. The alternative to the main resistor is actually to use CMOS, of course. And CMOS has proposing some solutions in many cases now. Uh, the first uh, topology that we have in here in the state of the art is the simple current mirror. How can we understand the simple current mirror? Actually, we have currents that are presynaptic and postsynaptic, and you amplify it with the ratio of the current mirror. So it's very, very simple, very good. What is the drawback of using simple current mirrors? Is if we still look on this uh, literature review, we will see that the basic current mirror synapse consumes as the blue line. The proposed ultra low power synapse is here on the orange line. And now I draw the red line for you guys to see uh, how much consumes the neurons that we have on the literature. And what we can see is actually a difference of a few orders of magnitude. And if you know a little bit of neural networks, you understand that you have more synapses than neurons. And by seeing this on the literature, I think by myself, it will consume much more and the power consumption of the synapses will blocks how deep can be the neural network because we cannot put more synapses to have a deeper network. So this is the main drawback of the synapses design. So now we see, we saw many uh, blocks and circuit level and uh, transistor level on the literature and we can ask ourselves okay how can you do this and now we have moved to a more simple topic so if you are a bachelor student now or a master student i think this is for you like if you want to start in this topic this is what you want to know to start 
drawing of neuromorphic circuits. So to start about the fundamentals, I will explain what is a manristor. A manristor is a device capable to memorize the charge flux relationship. It integrates the current and voltage relationship, and it has some resistant inertia. So if we check the recent publications, what we see is actually it's a junction, not from semiconductors, but oxide. It's titanium dioxide that we have. And the oxide ions will move from one side to another side, increasing or decreasing this barrier here. And this distance W will change. By changing the resistance, the W distance, we change the resistance, which is so-called the main resistance, which is the property of the main resistor. And we can move from some R on the minimum resistance to R off the maximum resistance available on this physical device. <clears throat> so the Ohm's law, it's, uh, it stays like this one. And this uh, is uh, micro, microscopic photos of uh, main resistors. When we see transistors, which is the main block of uh, the in-neurons or CMOS technology, the transistor is actually a three-terminal device that we have gate voltage, drain voltage, source voltage, and you have a current drain to source current that goes into the drain. And this relationship is a non-linear device. And it's a function of two variables. And this is actually the well-known uh, quadratic form of the current, the projection from IDS to VTS for different VGS. And this is the VGS uh, versus IDS for different DVDS. And this is uh, the non-mathematical modeling of the transistor. If we go deeper and we try to understand the physics of, for example, the NMOS, we have in the beginning uh, the VGS of the transistor that's close to zero, and uh, we have a depletion region under the gate that uh, avoids the charge conduction. When the transistor gate to source voltage is between zero and the threshold, we have the start of the formation of a channel, but this channel is not big enough to generate current conduction, and this is what we so-called the cutoff region. By increasing this Overhead of this uh, threshold voltage, and when the VGS is greater than the threshold voltage, we have a channel that forms, and this channel can be even bigger if the VGG, the, the voltage between gate and drain, between zero and VTH. These two conditions we will make what we so call the linear region. And cutoff region and linear region is also a fundamental topic on electronics. If we push forward, and if the junction gate to drain has a potential bigger than the threshold, we will move to the NMOS in saturation regime. And the previous equation here from the leading region will turn to this quadratic form that you are well known from uh, electronic courses. And uh, you will try to find this effective voltage to drive the channel, to control the channel that controls the conduction of your transistor. However, this is not what we are interested in. Because if we want to do low power circuit, we should avoid, avoid this strong inversion that is uh, the hypothesis behind of the classical quadratic model that you have studied probably in your bachelor's and master courses. In low power consumption, what you have to look is when the VGS is between zero and VTH. And when it is in this situation, the physics of semiconductor will point us a charge conduction delta Q, actually to Q with the charge of the electron, the delta NP, which is actually the minority charges injected into the channel, times the exponential of the differential of voltage, VTS minus VTH, divided by the thermal voltage. And what the, the professors maybe didn't tell, told you now is actually the variation of the minority charges is close to zero if and only if the channel is long and long enough means bigger than 300 nanometers. That's why in the beginning of this topic, I told you that we have to go to 65 nanometers, 28 nanometers technology, because when we are in this technology, this assumption is false and the delta Q is not zero and it will behave as an exponential function of a real number. And this is actually what we want, because 
if you know a little bit of uh, neuromorphic and uh, neural network mathematics, people are looking for HELU, which is a diode shape. And diodes behave as exponential equations. So if we can explore this exponential charge conduction, we can mimic with subtraction region and NMOS transistors and PMOS transistors, the same behavior, the same mathematical behavior of neural networks and natural intelligence. And that's what we are pushing. <clears throat> to do so, what I advise my students to, to learn is actually the unified control model, which is actually an all region model that will try to interpolate what we so-call weak inversion to strong inversion. And uh, by using these equations, and you can learn more about this model following up this reference here, uh, we can determine which is the best bias point of your circuit to be in weak inversion, but also explores uh, low leakage, to explore uh, noise control, to explore many other characteristics of analog design. And by the end of the day, if you go back to the schematics that you have presented, you will see this main circuit here. You have a PMOS transistor connected to an NMOS transistor. And this is classically named inverter. And a weak inverter, weak inverse, the inversion inverter is not a digital inverter. So the first thing that you have to do is you look to this and you have to forget that it is a inverter, a digital gate. It's not. And how to use it? First of all, the transistor should be biased in weak inversion. You have to use some kind of unified control current model or GM of ID methodology. These two lead to you, you this set of equations here or this one, you have like two options. They are concurrent on the literature, but both of them are presenting the same thing, which means the behavior of the current uh, conduction is exponential of the voltage control. And if you do mathematics of uh, this current going into, this current going out, and this current going into, the Kish of current law, you can find the results that are presented here from this reference. So you can see that the V out, the voltage out, on this inverter is not digital. It's actually a tangent, hyperbolic tangent function of the input voltage and also the relationship between the GMs of the transistor N and the transistor P, which is actually a relationship between the sizings of this transistor. And how can we do best? What we have found in the literature is the best trade-off is to a IF, the inverter coefficient, close to one which means in the boundary between weak inversion and moderate inversion. And this is what we are aiming to do in neurons with this kind of uh, circuit. So <clears throat> let's move to the physical implementations. When we talk about physical implementations, we are talking also directly about layout. And we have here the modest lacquer biomimetic layout, the simplified version, and the leak integrated fire that we're publishing this paper, from also from our team. And this is actually a library that we have in our facilities and they are dedicated to our neural networks. But the first thing that we can see is the size of these neurons. It's about 10 by 10, okay? And we aim at 10 micrometers by 10 micrometers because this is actually the equivalent surface of a neuron in a mammal brain. So we are trying to mimic the sizing, the power consumption and how they connect by each other. The results that we have found for these three models are the energy efficiency can be as low as a two femtojoules per spike, and the spike is actually the unity of information in a spike neural network. Uh, for this, the frequency uh, spiking frequency should be higher than 100 kilohertz, and we found few hundreds of kilohertz, like you can see in these graphs. And uh, the key for this design is layout. Actually, the low leakage is the most important challenge when you are doing the physical design of electronic neurons. And you can find more information in the cited papers in here. So if I conclude this part, this chapter of electronic neurons, the state of the art are presented by this one. You have modest lacquer, leak integrating fire options. The target technologies on the literature are uh, 65, 28 nanometers. 
Uh, the areas are a bit of the same, near to 30 uh, micrometers square. Uh, you can see two options that are a little bigger than that. They are our versions. Actually, we were doing this on the beginning and we are trying to have more biomimetic and a greater uh, frequency spike. So you can see here that we have about 400 kilohertz of a spiking frequency. And all of uh, proposals has an energy efficiency close to two femtojoules per spike, which is actually the figure of merit of this uh, electronic neuron. If we move forward for the synapses, the physical design of the synapses is you have a, some kind of RC filter, which is actually a diode connected transistor with a capacitor, and you have transconductors that will uh, multiply the current that is uh, presynaptic to postsynaptic, have, having a excitation current from the P side and uh, the inhibition current from the N side. So this is our simple synapse proposal. Also, still small in print from six to seven uh, micrometer square. And uh, here is the transfer function from uh, the synaptic current, considering an F spike input. <clears throat> but having these two separators, in neurons from one side and synapses from the other side, is not actually the faithful full biomimetic behavior. Because the human brain, it has a soma, an axon, and then you have the synapses on the dendrites, and they are all together one single structure. So what we have proposed last year is actually to put the sum of the Morris Lecker uh, model, an axon, and dendrites considering simple current uh, mirrors. And we finally found this imprint of 10 by 10 micrometers that I have talked with uh, energy efficiency of uh, 10 femtojoules per spike, which is quite good considering that we have neurons and synapses, most of the results on the state of the art, they only show neurons or synapses. And we have found a mismatch of a four picoamps and a standard deviation when we consider pause layout and Monte Carlo simulations of 2% uh, considering excitation on inhibition. And this is actually the transfer function between the input excitation current and the output postsynaptic uh, current. <clears throat> okay, now we have our neuron uh, synapses and they are a cell that we can multiply and create a grid like a neural network. To go from neurons to spiking neural networks, what we have to do is we have to have an activation function. And first of all, uh, the idea is to have a physical informant model. This is actually the blue line here. It's a cadence pause layout activation function extracted from the PV slide. Another idea is uh, to use mathematical activation function. And this is actually the orange line here. It's a sigmoid activation function that we can easily find on Python, PyTorch, or TensorFlow uh, optimizers to design your neural networks. But both, they are very different. So the idea of a, a general modeling uh, engineer is let's try to do some fitting and let's play with between them to have a mathematical model that conforms to the physical model. And actually what we have found that is fitting is not always the best solution. It's not the best solution because it's hard to get a fitting that is close enough to the physical model, the physical activation function that does not have this uh, discrete uh, derivative next to zero. And here, what we see in black is actually a polynomial fitting with a third order. And it's quite far away of the physical model. And if we want to have a polynomial fitting that is very close to the blue one, it will have to move to a higher order around 15 to 18, which is too much complex to put into Python to test it and to draw to, to design your neural network. <clears throat> the second outcome of this uh, topic is actually noise. When we talk about neural networks and more cloud-based neural networks, what we have is numbers. The synaptic weights are numbers. Uh, the neurons are actually resist the resistors, and they are deterministic values, signals. But when we use a physical-based devices with transistors, we have this generation of thermal noise. And if we test these neurons that we have in 300 kilo, uh, Kelvin, which is actually 25 Celsius, uh, 27 Celsius, 
uh, we will find that uh, the position of the spike will jitter. And this is actually a common uh, event for uh, digital problems like the jitter noise and the uh, noise uh, the, in the clock that the transition on the clock rise will change the position and you have actually a distribution considering a mean, which is actually the position that you want to transit, and you have a standard deviation. So here we plot the standard deviation of the jitter noise of our uh, neurons, and uh, they are around a few hundreds of kilohertz, and we can observe a standard deviation of a few microseconds. And from our point of view, this is too much. So to end this uh, uh, talk with some illustrations. Now let's put all these things together, means uh, neurons, synapses, and let's try to build real neural networks. Starting from system level, uh, we, we our first try is to make an analog spike neural network, and we decide to synthesize for the application of MNINST. MNINST is a, a common problem in neural network when we try to identify numbers from zero to nine, the character, and uh, we implemented this neural network considering the leaf, modest lacquer, simplified, and biomimetic. Here I depict the areas of the full uh, synthesized neural network and the power consumptions. And you see that has a, a, some kind of uh, consumption floor. We cannot uh, consume less than a few hundred of nanowatts of these neural networks considering the number of the synapses. The synthesis that we have found has 86 uh, neurons and uh, 1,238 synapses, which is quite a lot. And actually, we did our best to minimize this, to minimize the power consumption. And by minimizing the complexity of the neural network, we lost in accuracy. So the training that we have made appears here on the bottom of this uh, slide. Uh, the best we can achieve is 90%. And if you are used with neural networks training, you are aiming more like 99%, 95% of accuracy. And we cannot do that with simplified neural networks for physics and electronics models. <clears throat> if we consider also low power, which is the green line that we have here shown, uh, the accuracy drops a lot. And which means that uh, by trying to minimize the power consumption and use these models in the best way to energy efficiency, we lose some nonlinear properties of the neural, which degradates the accuracy of the neural network. The second example that I show <coughs> is uh, a DPD, a digital price distortion of uh, a PA to linearize a PA. So this is actually the model, the neural network model that we made, and this is the measurement setup that we achieved, okay? The references uh, are this one. So the result is uh, we have synthesized 80 uh, neurons and uh, 54 synapses. It still is actually a two layer. We have the input layer and the output layer that is no deep neural network is no hidden layers uh we found a very simplified value and the measurement results has uh, pointed that we can improve the output uh, the pa output performance uh which is classical in here in black and it is reduced using the counterparts of the literature the classic methodology for dpd is marked on yellow on the bottom is the best one and we have two options using artificial neural network, which means cloud-based in blue. And in red is the spiking neural networks using the neuromorphic models that I have presented in this uh, topic. So both of them, cloud-based, software-based, and uh, electronic-based, achieve similar results considering the reduction of the power spectral density on the adjacent channels, which is good for linearizing a PA. The third example is a neuromorphic analog spiking modulator. This means that we want to modulate the information, the, the data, into information in spikes. What we have found is uh, we can uh, sample and hold uh, audio signal here shown in red. And the samples, they are coded in spikes by the gray one, the gray uh, neuron and the derivative of the signals are coded by the black one. And we can see that we can estimate the derivative going down here or up here, being like this behavior or that behavior, which is quite good. 
and the imprint, the size of the silicon area is between 15 micrometers per 25 micrometers. And the power consumption goes to 80 uh, femtojoules per conversion, per conversion. This means by per sample. This is the amount of the energy required to uh, convert this sample here or that one. And we can do this with a 9 bit resolution on 55 nanometer technology. <clears throat> the fourth example is uh, the neuromorphic enhanced radio. And now we are moving to the cognition of the IoT. IoT can uh, listen or see electronic waves. And the IoT source here sends these electronic waves more close to antenna one or antenna two, considering ears or eyes, if you compare with a human being, and one of them will receive more RF power than the other one, which means that you are closer to the source. So the system, what we does is an envelope detector with a transconductor that generate a current that uh, excite a neuron that can be, for example, the leak integrated and fire neuron. And uh, we have two neurons like this that are connected with a third neuron in a neural network. And the results that we have found this is the secret level implementation, okay? And the result that we have found is this one. We have a compact layout and a, a very low power. The layout is about 20 micrometer per 20 micrometer. Good imprint with only three neurons. Take this in consideration. Uh, the spiking generation is quite reliable. We have here some PVT results consider Monte Carlo and corners. Uh, however, <clears throat> The transfer function is not quite linear when we see uh, the power, the variation, power variation between the two antennas. So it means that if it's negative, it's close to the antenna on the left. If it's positive, it's close to the antenna to the right. And the relationship is not quite linear. So uh, we don't know if it needs to be linear and if how much the dynamic it should be. But we can detect some spikes and we can detect at least it is right or left now by the results here. So to conclude my topic, and this is my final words, uh, if you want to do some uh, green electronics and green AI, the first thing that you have to do is use less electronics, use less AIs, uh, or use better or design better AIs, better electronics. Uh, the cloud-based and pure software, it's not green at all. It consumes a lot of power during the training, and it's also consuming power during the usage. Uh, if you want to put this AI on edge, on real-time applications on IoT, the first thing that you have to figure out how to do is co-design. Because once you have computers, software-based as a cloud, but you also need electronics and circuit-based solutions. And both should be designed together to have part of the neural network into hardware, which can be analog or digital solutions, and part of the neural network should be into the computer, which be coding. <clears throat> the second thing that you have to figure it out is energy harvesting for battery-less devices. These uh, devices should be uh, as low as possible. And the third thing that I want to say is mimicking the human being is probably not the nice idea, the better idea that we can do in semiconductor. Why? Actually, machines does not sense like humans. Human has the 50 senses. Like we can see, we can hear, we can uh, smell, we can uh, touch things, but machines doesn't do that. So we have to figure it out how machines can feel the world by electromagnetic field, by temperature, by acceleration, by pressure, and etc. The second thing is the speed of the machine is much higher than the human brain. The human brain is around 10 hertz, and we are not here to build machines with a clock of uh, 10 hertz. And the third thing is the power consumption of the machine is much greater than the human brain. Now, if you, by just finishing watching this talk, know that your brain has consumed in average 20 watts to understand what I'm talking to you now. And to do this on machines, we don't have computers consuming 20 watts. And 20 watts is actually less than most of uh, electric bulbs that we have. It's less than what we need to uh, have light on this room. So machines consume more power. We have to consume this power to move in a way that is smarter. So 
uh, thank you very much. Uh, if you have any questions on the chat, I will take it. Uh, if you want to contact me, you can contact by the neural, uh, their social media networks. I have a LinkedIn, uh, Orcs ID, uh, and also my website on Central Superlec. Uh, we are considering PhD students, uh, master's students, and uh, international corporations. Feel free to, to talk with me and uh, type of questions. So thank you very much, Pietro, for your very nice talk. So I have a first question here from Aninja Sundar Dar from uh, the India Institute of Technology in Kahagpur, India. So uh, his question is, uh, do you foresee the emergence of uh, any single device, maybe not uh, be single uh, CMOS compatible, that would mimic biological neuro in near future? Uh, yes, I have seen a few, a few devices that conduct ions. Uh, they are called like uh, a, a chemical transistors and they transform ions uh, movement into electric fields. Another one that could be interesting is the single electron transistor. Uh, which could be very uh, good to mimic uh, the biological neuron in the near future. But uh, what I have seen in the literature for this uh, single electron transistors is they need a cryogenic uh, environment. So we have to deal with this power consumption in another way. The transistor will not consume the power. Uh, the cryogenic uh, bathtub will consume the power to reduce the temperature. So. I don't know if we will win always. That's why I finished my talk about code design and talking how we can put things together. So maybe we have this emergent uh, technology, but I'm not sure that they will win the match with the transistor, with the CMOS, considering <coughs> the whole power consumption of the system. Thank you. So we have another question by Juan Sulzbach from Federal University of Rio Grande do Sul. Professor, is there any change in the neurons spike in frequency as you move towards the dendritic the structure, slide 26, <coughs> due to the additional capacitive loading of postsynaptic neurons? Oh, I have the slide 26 uh, here, uh, Professor Hayes. And uh, no, the spiking frequency doesn't change much. Actually, the spiking frequency is uh, how you draw an oscillator, like uh, trying to explain this with uh, simple words for a bachelor or master's students that are seeing us now. Uh, you have an oscillator. It's a kind of ring oscillator. And this is actually the spiking frequency. And this is what drives the maximum uh, frequency. So uh, we can uh, design with any frequency. And uh, for this one, we uh, found the same. Uh, we were aiming the same frequency of the previous one, which means few hundreds of kilohertz. But uh, we are not interested in here in showing the frequency anymore because uh, what are the signals are the currents that go into and the currents that go out of the transistors or the neurons. And this is actually to try to draw an activation function like this, considering the biomimetic model. Thank you. Well, I see no more questions here in the chat channel. If someone still have a question, please do it as soon as possible. So I have one. Uh, uh, Pietro, um, how you can... Uh, uh, compare the reliability of the solutions you are proposing with the traditional ones? It's a good question. Actually, I won't say that it is reliable, okay? Uh, fair point. Why? Actually, when we are trying to mimic the neuron conditions and the neuron behavior, we are also mimicking uh, the neuron drawbacks. And the brain is under uh, our head at 20, 37 degrees Celsius. So if we change temperature, it uh, does not follow the same performance. It's not robust for temperature variation. As you can see here, you have a little bit of uh, variation of the F spike considering the temperature. And this variation can be quite important. The second thing 
is uh, when we do uh, ultra low power sub threshold transistor, and this comes from semiconductors uh, physics, uh, we have too few charges into the channel. So any error that we have, it's a, a high density error, and this will reduce the reliability of uh, the device. Okay. So I see no more question. So uh, then I'd like to thank you again, Pietro, for the very nice talk in a very nice, interesting subject. For sure, the evolution of technology will give uh, more results and, uh, and uh, we always try to find solutions observing how the human brain works, no? Yeah, so, yeah. Uh, For many think, times. This is how yeah. we invented computers. Yeah. So thank you very much. And I uh, wish you all uh, a very nice weekend.